The, the purpose of today is really to talk about really two major questions. And those are, first, making the choice between what I call being an intentional individual contributor and choosing a path to, down, the, down the sales leadership track or executive leadership track and kind of how you make those decisions. And then once you've made that decision for yourself and you know which path you want to go down, how do you best position yourself to be in the right place to pr usually make a lot of money as, as an individual contributor or in the, in the sales leadership track, especially positioning for that first step. Like that's a really difficult one for a lot of people, right? I've been an individual contributor, I've never managed people. How do I take that first step? So that's, that'll be the big, broad part of the conversation, <laughs> but just sort of contextually, I, I built this panel really intentionally. Um, if you could give us just a super fast rundown of, of who you are and, and kind of the career highlights so that we understand contextually that background. Uh, to know where you're coming from with, with some of your answers. Colin, why don't you kick us off? Sure, sure. So, hi everyone, Colin Spector. I'm the regional head of sales for Namely in our Southern California office, which is based in Santa Monica. And I've been with Namely just over four years now. I started there as the 25th employee overall, the sixth sales hire starting out as an SDR, so a lead generation um, member of the team. There were only six of us reporting up to our director of sales at the time. Um, and over the last four years, I progressed into an account executive role, then to a senior account executive role, and then to a remote account executive. I started with Namely in New York, and then moved into Los Angeles as a kind of lone wolf, wolf in the field uh, remotely, which was a great experience. So invested the last year building out that market, and then in November of last year, opened the office there and started hiring people under me to be uh, the head of that operation in LA. Awesome. So, Welcome, Bill. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Bill Pye, and I'm with Cornerstone On Demand. I am a director of strategic accounts. I started out my career with IBM, spent several years there as a sales rep and then as a sales manager. Then I decided to move to, I was in Chicago, then I decided to move to S San Francisco to get in on the uh, internet boom in the late 90s. I was employee number 17 and the first sales manager at a uh, startup that later went public and was very successful. Then I continued through a number of jobs, winding up as a VP of sales at a company called Learn.com, which uh, later got acquired by Oracle. Then in 2010, I was recruited by a former uh, colleague to join Cornerstone On Demand. And he wanted me, I was looking for a sales management position, and he said, that's not what I had you in mind for. I am looking for a senior salesperson to manage uh, our largest clients, as we now have a few, like PwC. So I wasn't uh, looking for a non-management position, but I thought I'd give it a try with the understanding if I was successful. Uh, after a couple of years, I'd have a chance to go back into management. And that happened, but when they came to me and said, do you want to move into management? For the last few times, I've been saying, no, I, I like what I'm doing now. <laughs> and so I've remained a senior salesperson now for uh, the last eight years. Been uh, number one on my team, seven out of those eight, and it's been a good run. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Debbie? Yeah. Hi, I'm Deb Rapson, and um, I started my career 30 years ago in advertising. I um, graduated with a specialty in media and telecom and went right into media and did that for the first seven years and then went into management for four years. I was going for a major account position, and uh, the GM there said, that's not what I had in mind for you. And, um, and put me into a management position. I said, what the heck, I'll give it a try. It was pretty early on in my career. I think I was eight years in. <laughs> and loved it and built a team from three people to 21 and managed another manager. And then decided I wanted to start making more money. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so I left management and went um, into the field and worked on global and strategic accounts and enterprise accounts through uh, various you know technology companies and then came back to uh, marketing and marketing technology um, and have spent the last four you know 14 years in Martech and as an individual contributor and um, I keep getting recruitment calls for VP of sales and management positions um, but so far I still want to make a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> Mike. Hi, I'm Mike Tetchin. I'm a senior manager at LinkedIn, our marketing solutions business uh, a manager, maybe not making as much money. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I started off my career um, doing strategy work uh, at an agency in Chicago called DB. 
I worked on accounts like McDonald's, Dell, Pet Boys, which is essentially aftermarket car parts, but it actually was the most interesting out of the three. Um, and then I moved into business development at a different agency in terms of bringing new clients in. Kind of caught the, the bug for sales and also wanted to drive uh, more money for myself. And so I started my first job at Newsweek um, right when it was starting to, starting to peter out a little bit in terms of uh, print subscriptions. Uh, had an amazing director there that you know you luck out sometimes and you um, you find a person that you're like, I get you and you get me. And so um, uh, he's an icon in uh, Chicago sales in there. So had a great experience, but um, I was foolish and traded that in for a much bigger brand in the Wall Street Journal Digital Network. Uh, worked on WSJ, Barron's, Market Watch, All Things D with Kara Swisher and Walt Mossberg. Um, and from there, I had a good experience. I moved uh, over to LinkedIn eight years ago, and I managed Microsoft was my key account there. Um, completely coincidence that they purchased us, and I happened to be working on the account. Will not take any credit for the acquisition. But, uh, <laughs> um, and then I've been in management the last uh, two years. Excellent. So as, as you can see, this, it's a panel with where even the intentional individual contributors have served in, in leadership roles. So I, I think that that experience is, is really helpful. So let me start with all of you on, on this question, Mike. We'll work uh, from you backwards. What Talk about the pros and the cons between that contributor role versus being in a, in a management role. Yeah. Um, so, so the way I always looked at it and the way I look at our individual contributors, at least from an enterprise key account standpoint, it, you know, I tell them they are leaders. Um, they do touch a lot of people within the organizations because cross-functionally we need a lot of people to deliver the value, to deploy and deliver the value. So I do tell them they are leaders and they are essentially managers. Uh, they just have a lot more autonomy than I do <laughs> and the ability to go run their business, be with their clients, and work on their solutions. Um, you know, the con, I guess, for for management is, you know, you do make, like you mentioned, a little less. Um, the hope is, like, I'm trying to play the long game in it and that the things that I learn, I can contribute later. Um, but it is the autonomy is, is the largest part is, like, you have a lot of people that are dependent on you. Um, that lessens as you train and coach people to be less dependent on you and that they own the outcome. That's where you can reduce some of that. Excellent. Debbie? So that's a really interesting question. There are a lot of uh, lot of differences, that's for sure. I think um, there are benefits um, to both and also bad things about both. Um, I think that for individual contributor, definitely the autonomy, the freedom to run your own business is one of the things that I love about being an individual contributor and the ability to work out of my house and be kind of uh, you know responsible to my customers but um, and also to my teammates um, but to lead for sure a, a group of people and collaborate with a group of people um, in a different way than I did when I was in management so management is um, certainly um, you're less in control of course of your schedule and um, and then you're also um, you know, you're kind of a middleman sometimes uh, in a management position. You are taking orders from the top that you don't necessarily have the ability to control, like things when layoffs come on and that kind of thing. And, and I think that happens less so in individual contributor um, positions. But, um, but I learned so much from being a manager to be a better individual contributor. It was a great experience. It really taught me how to be a better sales leader. Yeah. Excellent, Bill. Yeah, uh, thanks. And that is a point I'd like to follow up on later, what Debbie just mentioned. I do think being a manager and a sales VP makes me more effective as an individual contributor now. But in terms of why I'm, I am continuing in this position, I'd sort of net it out as saying, uh, you know, why do I want more stress for less money? <laughs> and uh, that's basically, well, that's basically what it is. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, doing better uh, compensation-wise than I ever did as a manager, better than, I'm, than my own manager, who uh, constantly reminds me of that. <laughs> it's just, it's one of those things where, uh, uh, you know, uh, Peter, the management guru Peter Drucker once said that uh, so much of what we call management consists of making it difficult for people to work. Uh, you know, so much of management is, involves reporting and, uh, you know, process. Uh, enforcement 
And it's very difficult sometimes to be focused on what you're actually supposed to be doing, which is to be selling and helping your team sell. You know, there's a lot of clutter that has to go through that. You know, fire drills, on reporting before quarterly calls, whatever the case may be. I decided at a certain point that uh, I'd just rather focus on the things that make money, the things that I really know how to do down cold, and just be responsible for myself and be better compensated for it. Awesome. Um, I would say some of the cons uh, I'll share, looking at the Namely Accelerator program right now, I'm like, wow, did I, did I make the right decision? <laughs> uh, no, but uh, <laughs> jokes aside, I'd say the, the big pro, having moved into this role, would be the impact I'm seeing uh, that I'm making on the, uh, my account executives' um, lives, really, um, being, being able to see how I can impact their deals, uh, having more insight into into different perspectives on deals. So as, as an individual contributor, you're kind of, you're that, that person in the trenches focused on your one point of view, right? You're focused on your deals ahead of you. And then now as uh, a manager, and again, I've only been in this since November, uh, I'm starting to see, I, I, I get kind of a, a level step above in a macro view, so to speak. So being able to see different perspectives now, different deals, different strategies, and, and also realizing that in sales, right, the art and science of sale, as we saw throughout the weekend so far, there are so many different strategies and approaches that you can take to uh, your, your, your deals and accounts that you're working on. And I'm seeing it now with the own account, my own account executives that I've hired onto the team so far. They all have such a unique approach as the artists that they are with their sales. And it's, I've learned so much from them as, as much as I'd like to download the namely knowledge to them that I've accumulated over the last four plus years. I'm learning so much from them. And, I think if, if I do go back to an individual, individual contributor one day, it's only going to make me that much more successful. Mm -hmm. um, it also makes a, a larger appreciation for what my managers have had to go through. Right? You always wonder, what's on the other side of the curtain as an individual contributor? And you really don't appreciate it until you're there. And that's something that's really been uh, hugely eye-opening for me. So Nice. It's like being a parent, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure enough. Oh, Many wow. ways. I, I was really not very nice to my parents. So, in, you know, I, I've always, I, I consider myself to be an intentional individual contributor. I actually recruited one of my best friends to be my current boss. Many of you have met Aaron. Um, because I, I think that that opportunity, I, when you're in that position to control, I think who you work with as your leader also has a really significant uh, impact. And, and one of the themes that I see through the show, I, I don't, ask about it as often as, as I should, but I feel like I don't think I've talked to anybody who is number one, top 1% 1 despite their boss, right? They always have a good, strong leader that they're able to partner with and kind of help them win and, and do that. So we'll, we'll come back to some of those things in terms of advice to leadership, having been kind of on, on both sides. I think that's useful as well. But for the folks that are, again, in this decision point, what questions should they ask themselves to make the right choice for themselves about the, the appropriate, the most appropriate path? Debbie, you, you want to start? I feel like you're, you're the best at the questions. Well, <laughs> well the, um, the questions that, um, that I ask myself, frankly, all the time, because I'm, I am getting bombarded with a lot and, you know, at different times in my career, and I ask myself, Where's my heart? Where's my motivation? You know, what does it, you know, inside of myself, um, what am I really looking for to accomplish? And as you go through different phases of your career, you're looking to do different things. In the very beginning, like Kyle, you know, he's really drinking from the fire hose, looking to learn, right? Learn about a lot of the sales stuff, right? But then there's learning about how to manage um, people and how to um, collaborate with teams. And there are all sorts of kind of different phases that, that you learn along the way. And I think that, um, you know, the questions that you ask are, what are you motivated by? You know, um, what, you know, what are you drawn to? You really have to listen to your inside intention on what you're drawn to. Are you drawn to, for example, I'm drawn right now um, to making a huge amount of money. I don't even want to say how publicly how big am amount of money I want to make, but um, I'm driven to it, right? And so I'm also at a stage in my career where I could share my knowledge and wealth and it would be um, amazing for me and amazing for a team of people and I would love to do that, but I'm drawn more towards this goal that I have that I haven't achieved yet. 
And so I think you got to ask yourself, what are your goals? Um, you know, what, what speaks to you inside of you? And, um, and I think you have to ask yourself, um, you know, what is going to challenge you and what is going to make help you grow as an individual? Um, because we are all transforming all the time. And, um, and it's, you know, what are the next challenges that I want to have in, uh, in kind of my next leg of my journey? Excellent. And oh, go, go for it. Yeah, sure. Uh, if I could add on to that, I do agree 100% uh, with Debbie's point that uh, timing has a lot to do with it where you are in your career. I would recommend that any uh, young, successful salesperson in the early stage of their career, when they have a chance, try management at some point. Give it a try. You may love it. You know, there are some great things about it. Hearing you made me remember some of the things I loved. Helping young salespeople, being part of a team that works together to achieve a common objective is one of the most satisfying things I've found in business. So it is a wonderful thing, and so you may love it. You know, give it a try. At a certain point, you may decide you want to get off of that track, but you need to experience it to really be able to make that choice. Uh, but later in your career, like I am at this point, you know, sometimes I might think, you know, the saying goes, the trouble with the rat race is that even if you win, you're still a rat. Uh, you know, you may, you may decide you don't want to do that. So timing plays a big part. But once again, I would recommend that everybody, when you have a chance, if you're early in your career and you're successful, if you have a chance, when you have a chance to be a manager, give it a try. Because it's, an, it's not only is it something you should try to do to see if you can become the, the greatest person you can be, but even if you decide it's not for you, and this is something maybe we can talk about a little bit later, I think it's made me a better individual contributor now, having known what it's like to be a manager. Yeah, so that, I think that point's really coming, coming across, right? This idea of it's worth trying out. At the very least, you're going to be better in, in, uh, as a performer, in, as an individual contributor. I, I think one of the traps um, that a lot of us has, have probably experienced, uh, perhaps negatively, is uh, we've been managed by somebody who was the best seller and though that skill set just didn't translate and they had a lot of uh, trouble with it. What, beyond the questions that you're asking yourself, who, who can you look to? What, what questions can you ask of those around you to sort of flush out? Do you think I'd be good at this, I guess, is, is the question. I, I would bring back maybe uh, Jackie's presentation from earlier, right? Being a parachute packer, are you, are you maybe as an individual contributor, do you see yourself, are, and oftentimes if you are a top performing AE, it's because you generally care about helping your clients and customers, and I would say that also translates to the rest of the sales team, right? You're, you become a natural team leader as an individual contributor. You're already coaching others on their, on their deals, how to navigate objections, how to navigate competition and landmines, right? be the, the, help them be the landmine detector. Um, so if, if you're coming out as that person already and, and that becomes a highly fulfilling, asking yourself like, is this fulfilling enough to where I might take a slight decrease in pay cut initially until you get your team ramped up, right? Hopefully you get enough folks performing above quota. You all get into accelerators together and get on that rocket ship together. Um, but understanding is that fulfilling enough for you? And long-term career-wise, um, if you are looking to be in management, CRO, CSO positions, um, is that a track that you want to go down? I'd say those are, are so one, like character, and two, career-wise, long-term, where do you see yourself going are some questions to really think about. Mike, you're the king of collaboration. I'm sure you've got some thoughts on this. Yeah, so, uh, so, so what I was, was great at as a seller was I could build solutions. Like I could really dive into someone's business and you know, design, uh, taking my agency experience and really designing something that was beneficial to them and really just like complete the whole process I had that honed in, like I was, like that was my thing. I'd come back and I'd share my ideas with the team and everyone kind of looked at me like, hey, he knows what he's doing, like he's differentiated. So when I was moving into management, I was like, oh great, I'm just gonna help everyone do what I did. And um, it hasn't been like that at all. <laughs> um, the first one is, uh, um, I, you know, I'm somewhat quiet and cerebral. Like I love strategy and I love diving into it. Um, where my strengths don't really lie, where I've had to improve is like interpersonal. Um, I deal with a lot of people problems, right? Because we, we collaborate with so many different teammates internally, also with clients. I'm helping people work through, hey, 
just get along with this person. This is how you need to do it. Didn't think that would even be a part of the position at all, where you have to next have like very frank conversations where as a seller, I was always about collaboration and having people trying to get consensus. Now I'm challenging people and having very uncomfortable conversations with someone who naturally just wants to like, hey, let's just get along. That's really hard to do like that. I take that home at night, which leads to the next one, which is like empathy. You have to put yourself in their shoes. You know, someone may be stuck and underperforming. There's probably something behind the scenes that's causing that. That is like some deep, deep stuff, right? And so you have to be able to flesh it out without being too intrusive, um, but also help them troubleshoot that. And that's been the, like if I would have known, <laughs> because again, it was my weakness, that it would have been that intense, I probably would have rethought it like you it's very much a, a personal role where you're trying to challenge coach push and help people fight through just like people problems and that's that's really hard and stuff that you you take home I mean you you take home and I think to your point of doing it young is like you go home and you have a family and your mind isn't spinning about a business problem which you can kind of shelve away you're spinning with all these other issues. It reminds me a lot of when uh, my wife was a teacher and she now stays home with the kids. Like she can compartmentalize all these uh, issues that these kids were having at home. Like I, I still like think about these things. And so um, I think when you're considering it, the business side is almost easy. It's really the personal human aspect that you just have to be great with humans or be willing to make yourself really uncomfortable because it's, it, it's, it's stuff that starts to give you gray hairs and like <laughs> like really kind of wrecks your weekends too, where you're just like <laughs> trying to fight uh, through it. Mm -hmm. So I would say like where, when white space, to your point of doing it younger, is when you have more responsibility at home and you lack that white space to troubleshoot it, where you're trying to just be a good mm -hmm. husband, wife, parent, oh man, it kind of jams those relationships as well because you're hanging on to the stuff at work. So. Um, Anyway, moral of the story is like, uh, <laughs> is like really think about the personal aspect of this. It's just the business stuff really is, to me, it's really easy. It's like that really personal stuff that, yeah. that no one thinks about. They think it's all business. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're, they're both extraordinarily hard roles, but in very, very different ways. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 So, Colin, let me, let's take just one step back because you've progressed all the way through, right? You went SDR, AE, bigger AE, all of this stuff. What about for somebody that is even earlier in their career, right? Sort of maybe SDR coming into that that first role. What advice do you have for them? The most logical step there is likely to an AE, although maybe they're looking at like an inside sales manager role. What what what, what would you tell to them to help them just think through the very early stages of their career? Sure. So I, I think with sales, there's a couple paths you there's several paths you can go, but a couple buckets that I, I put it in. You can go with uh, a larger established company or you can go with a startup, maybe post series A, post series B, a place that, that can pay you a good salary still and where if you're successful and you help that company be successful and everyone's successful together, you can hyper speed up your career <laughs> path. And, and that's the decision that I made. I, I had come from a prior startup which failed and said, you know what, I'm gonna do this again, but someone that's post series A, so my one before was a, a seed, I was like, that was too small, that didn't work out. Um, so I found Namely, uh, as well as a few others I had applied for, and uh, joined them just after their Series A round as, uh, again, as I mentioned, when the six sales higher. And uh, being a part of that common mission to drive the company, we were fortunate to see success. And as success and opportunity opens, uh, you, you'll be able to, if you're performing and, and being a company person, really like owning, like not going to work to work, but being a company person, the company notices that and you can start to ask for um, new opportunities, new ways to grow. And in startups, you're often wearing many hats and can really flex beyond the job description. So um, for a young person um, just entering sales, I, I would say just that's the experience I went down so I could speak to that. Um, I, I highly recommend to take that path. Well, I think the, the asking for it, right? I mean, just having conversations, being open about what you want, how you want to develop, how you want to grow. I mean, Mike, I, th I think a lot about just LinkedIn because they're one of the best companies like culturally in terms yeah. of their next plays and the way that they help people really develop a career. And, you know, I, I, most places really aren't like that. I think that you have to take much more ownership 
uh, along with franchise yeah. kind of idea. Like you have to take ownership of your career and your own path. But again, it's having those conversations as many as you can inside, outside, and just being open with, here's what I think I want. Yeah, yeah I just had a conversation with an associate AE last week. Um, the new fiscal year is coming up. And um, I, I told him, I said, hey, usually this is when opportunities are, are going to be available. Um, have you expressed your intentions of what you want to do next? He hadn't. So no one, no one knew. A lot of people are like, this person is talented. We have multiple people within the organization saying, is this person available? We would like to recruit them. And the position this person want is probably going to be available, but the decision maker knows nothing about his intention or what he's done to essentially have that role. And so I think just expressing it of like, and again, I know each place is a little different because some bosses get a little bothered if you're going on to your next play, but expressing like this is, I mean, people want to help you do it, but you just have to tell people, this is what I want to do and this is my plan to do it. And I think particularly, and Debbie, maybe you can comment on this. I think particularly for women, that issue, Tom reminded me of, of a conversation uh, earlier in the week or an issue that happened here in Austin where there was this giant panel, 15 people, and it was all men. And so there was a, a obviously people revolted, but it turned out the way that they had built that panel is they let everybody who asked be on the panel, which means that no women asked to be on the panel, right? And so I, I think that this is particularly important as we're all trying to bring more women into sales because they perform at, at a higher levels, like proportionally, it's, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. And I think as leaders as well, but it's, it's that key point of you have to ask and make your intentions known. I mean, Debbie, what would you add to that? Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. You do have to ask. And I think naturally women who go into sales are typically willing to ask. Um, but, um, but I think in general that's very true. And I, I spend a lot of time, um, my personal time, mentoring young women um, on just that topic. Um, helping them learn how to not only ask for what they want, but to negotiate uh, salaries, negotiate things that they want for themselves because, um, you know, women are not raised that way. Um, that I grew up in a house of three girls. We're all completely different human beings. Um, my parents told me I could do whatever I wanted to do. Um, and I definitely did, want, did not want to stay at home and raise kids, although I have two wonderful boys and I love them and have raised them, but I didn't want to only do that. And um, I remember my parents telling me, anything you want to do, you can make it happen. And I'm in a very non-traditional relationship where I married a high school teacher and I'm the money maker. And 30 years ago, well, 25 years ago when we got married, um, that was, very unusual. And um, I raised my boys. Um, I was one of the first women um, really kind of in my in technology to stay at home and work at home. Um, so do commuting um, 20 years ago. It was basically unheard of. And so, um, and I wanted to make sure that I nursed my kids and I was around my kids and I wanted to be there to, you know, have lunch with them and to pick them up from school. So I arranged my schedule to, where I was the top rep at the company, but also had this really full, rich life with my kids. And I think that that has a lot to do with asking for what you want. And my feeling, whether you're a man or a woman, is that you can really drive the direction of your life. You own it, you make decisions. Things happen and how you deal with them is all up to you. And so I'm a big believer in taking ownership. And I, I think that um, anyone, you know, I, I think we're moving out of that direction in our world. I think there's a lot more attention on women kind of, you know, leaning in. Um, and I think it's a great trend. And I think that women need sometimes help um, in, you know, in mentoring. People in general need that kind of mentoring, right, to, to bring themselves up and, um, and go in the direction that's best for them. Awesome. Yeah, wow. for sure. <laughs> Thank you.
So let's let's take a break because I want to transition to the the other topic um, in, in terms of how do you set yourself up in, in the best place. But do we any other questions before we do that? Just around uh, around making the choice and, and making that decision for yourself. All right, compensation. Yeah. Money. <laughs> I'm glad God you guys love you, are talking Kyle. about this. Um, compensation is not an evil topic like most people think that aren't in sales. I want to ask this question to Debbie. How do you get a clear pulse on the compensation market for what top performers could make? Um, I actually used to work for a compensation company, but it's hard to get a sense of like what top reps are making at other companies. Averages so are misleading. You you seem to have a good sense of how to get a gauge on the market. Like, how have you successfully done that in the past? I ask my network. I talk to my network. I talk to other people in sales, both men and women, and um, and I try to understand what they're going for. And um, I typically negotiate very high in salary. Um, as well as my compensation. I think I'm probably an outlier in that way, especially being a woman. But um, I typically look at what they're offering and I'll typically negotiate anywhere from, you know, 15 to 20,000 higher. Um, I look at all the components, not just the salary, but the guarantee that they offer. And I think, how long is it going to take me, right, to ramp up? So I talk to my community, but then I also take a look at what are my needs. Um, you know, how long do I think it's going to take for me to get ramped up in this job? Are these long sales cycles? Are they short sales cycles, right? What does that look like? And then I, every year, at the beginning of the year, make a personal goal. And my personal goal has nothing to do with anyone else. It's where I want to take the next step, where I want to grow and push myself. And so when a company talks to me about the comp plan um, at, you know, at the number, OTE, um, that, if, you know, if it's too low, I say it's too junior of a position, right? But, um, and it's never too high, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, um, but I always look at what do I want to make this year, you know? And then I kind of work backwards from there. But, but, you know, the question at hand is, you know, it's about asking your community and then understanding um, what do you want to do and are, you know, are, are, can you go make that happen? So part two question. <laughs> So this might be a simple answer, but how do you ask your network? Because money is a sensitive topic. And to just blatantly ask someone how much money you make, sometimes that can be tough to ask and tough to answer. So how have you successfully been able to position that in a way where you're not making people feel uncomfortable, but you're getting the answers that you need? Mm -hmm. Help me to understand, give me a range. It's you know between X and Y. That's how I do it. I, I, it's hard to say to somebody. And if somebody asked me, I'm not sure I would answer that question straight on. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd say, let's just say it's between X and Y. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Hey, guys. Um, I was hoping you could elaborate or define a good process for evaluating companies to work for at a start. So let's say someone um, new in their career in sales and trying to pick a good company or industry to work for. And then secondly, uh, for Bill, loved your episode. And if you can elaborate on the, the, the topic of the consultants or like consultant firms, for example, Deloitte and Accenture, because I really like the point you brought out there where you start at those companies and to really develop those skills that you could use and work at another company moving forward. Um, sure, I'll, I'll respond to that first. Uh, thank you, Luke. Uh, Luke is referring to a comment I made on the podcast with Scott about the sales training programs. Uh, you know, I think those of us who've read up on literature know that uh, you know, decades ago there were some famous companies that were famous for their sales training programs, such as Xerox and uh, IBM, which I went through, 13-month uh, sales training program, which is extremely uh, rigorous and I think uh, really, uh, uh, really set the stage or the foundation for my success. However, uh, what I've been most impressed with, uh, as I mentioned, were the people I've seen from the, uh, the uh, top consulting companies, so consulting slash advisory firms, uh, advisory firms uh, the Deloitte's, KPMG, 
uh, ENY, and so on. They really have a very strong uh, training program, and I've been most impressed by the people that, are, that uh, I've come out of there. And uh, I would recommend to my son, did he want to go into business, it's still a little bit early for him, that uh, he consider joining one of those firms to start out his career for the training uh, mm -hmm. that they offer. In answer to your question, Luke, uh, I, uh, there's a couple of different things. One, I do think, you know, the training program that a company that you're considering is an important thing to consider. You know, how can it give you a foundation for success that you can take wherever you are? At the same time, uh, also uh, smaller, fast-growing companies present more opportunities. You know, as uh, I think Colin had mentioned, uh, you can wear more hats and you can get a faster education in some ways, uh, especially in this day and age where uh, you know company life cycles and companies are growing much faster than they did before. I would, I, for me, when I look at a new opportunity, I would, uh, and I would suggest to other people, don't just consider the position or the company, but also consider at what point in its life cycle is the company. Mm -hmm. You know, I would submit that uh, it may not be as uh, interesting to join a mature company that's looking for single-digit growth each year. You know, look for a company that's just on the beginning of the hockey stick curve, and uh, you'll see you may take you places you never could imagine. Uh, in my own company, which has expanded globally since I first joined it, I have this one person I, uh, I act as a mentor for. He's not yet 30, and he started out with the company in the London office. He's then, since then spent a couple of years in the Sydney office, then in the Hong Kong office, and now he's in Singapore. He's not yet 30. That type of experience, that international experience, who knows where he's going to go with it. Yeah. Dana. Hello. Um, Mike, you really spoke to me in terms of all of you about the um, hello about the uh, decision to manage or not to manage. So I was a manager. I've been in my individual contributor role for 17 years. One of those years, I was in management, and it was horrific. Um, <laughs> I can't believe that people have all these problems. It's absolutely absurd. And, you know, I thought I would be more empathetic and I just wasn't. And I didn't really care. And what was strange to me, no, I'm just kidding. I cared deeply. And the thing was, is that I missed being around the customer. So through the years in being with Wiley, I have figured out ways to contribute. But I still can't make Wiley in some ways see, hey, you need to, um, I want to be able to contribute and start like a coaching and mentoring circle, but get paid for it. So what do you think is the best way for an individual contributor to still contribute but not manage and take that leadership role? Because in many ways, I feel as an individual contributor, I've had more power than I did when I was in management. So what would you suggest as a way that I could sort of get shake some trees and get some people to understand that that's vital within the organization. Yes. Then. Yeah. Um, where there's a problem that people can't solve, um, like that's what I do is I scan, right? Like where's gaps, where's problems that my director or <coughs> his boss um, don't have time for that they that they missed, and I'm also interested in, right? Um, so there's always a gap that someone needs help with. Yeah. Um, and people do it for me as well. Like, hey, can I help you do this? Um, that would be the, the biggest word of advice is just, like, I, I just, I'm just constantly scanning within the organization, like looking for problems that I can solve. And there's a bountiful amount of problems. So it really is like what mission are you looking for to achieve what skill that's going to get you to what's next. And then um, from there, it's, the opportunities kind of like find you where people will be like, hey, you did this. Would you mind taking this on right. as well? Um, but I qualify all of those too. Like you got to, once you become in demand, it's hard to turn off. And so um, uh, I just had the conversation four weeks ago uh, with my boss about it where he was essentially like, look, everyone wants your attention. You have to be very selective in what you choose. So yeah. know that once you open it up, it will find you. Yeah. yeah. And Dana, my perspective is just a little bit different because I work for a much smaller company, right? I don't work in, in the size of a, of a Wiley. But, and Mike, you made this point earlier, right? As an individual contributor, that does not mean you're not a leader, That's right. right? I've yeah. always thought of myself as somebody who leads from the field. And, you know, I've created opportunities within my organization. I host, that company has a podcast, 
<laughs> right? Because I like doing that. It's fun, right? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think finding those opportunities, and we're probably better positioned than most because we have that freedom, right? And so it's just whether you're asking for permission or asking for forgiveness, whichever path you choose, sometimes you just go do the stuff. Right, and the results kind of speak for themselves, and, and there it is, right? And, and then you can make the bigger ask, and maybe there needs to be some budget behind it and those yes. types of things. But you know, you just, it's, it's like anything else, like just take control of it and, and go after it. Excellent. And I think those, and you can create your own opportunities mm -hmm. to learn and grow beyond just generate revenue. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Yeah, I have this concept, it's called lead and execute um, with a team, that if you spot something, lead it, and I'll get in your slipstream, and I'll support you. Um, and then it's execution. We used to do divide and conquer, yeah. but that got a little political. Right. So now it's lead and execute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who else here like really wants to work for Mike right now? Yes. <laughs> yeah. like, sign us up. We will have two open positions come July. So there you go. There you go. Because you've probably moved some people up. Yeah. That's right. You Thank go. you, Mike. I will be in touch. Okay. <laughs> Thank, thank you, amazing panel, and resonated each one of your comments so, so well with me. I, I really like, I mean, Colin and I have kind of a very similar expertise in terms of the startup kind of world that we live in. Um, and somewhat along of, of Luke's line, how do you bridge that gap between the industry expertise and your background that you, you, know, you have the experience with, you have the confidence, you've sold into that customer base, you've got the relationships, but you know, you, maybe you're a little burnt out. Maybe you're looking at a, a different industry, something else to get really passionate about. But you don't have the relation. You don't have those connections. But you, you know, you really want to solve those problems, like like a med device, a health IT, something in that space that you can really make some change. How do you kind of bridge that, both in the companies you're looking for, in the conversations you have to market yourself and brand yourself? with what you want to be, but you may not have the expertise in, in the background to have, you know, to, to bring that value immediately. And that could be for anybody, really. Okay. Sure. Um, I, I can start off. I mean, I, th I think you kind of, you said an answer within your question, it sounds like, it sounds like you, you mentioned an industry that you're passionate about helping people within, it sounds like, maybe switching to, but you don't have the necessary expertise. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'd say the passion right there will help you solve that, right? If, if, if you're passionate about helping people through, like for example, before Namely, I was selling medical devices. And um, that's because I had, had knee surgery and understood the pains and the product I was selling was helping athletes. So I had a passion there. Now, I moved into HR software, which became payroll, which became insurance, right? Com um, completely different, but I understood the, um, the pains of, of, a, of a struggling startup, working in that startup, and the challenges with HR that we had. And I, and I understood, even though I didn't have an expert, a domain expertise uh, about HR, I understood the power of a solution for HR, for uh, employees, for people management. And um, when I came paired with Namely, I made a point to um, go on places like Quora, go on forums, interview people, that worked in HR and understood their expertise, understood their languages. There are, there are anonymous questions on Quora, like what are some of the HR jargon that a new person entering the space should be aware of? Some of those are my questions. So <laughs> we, have, we have Google now, we have the internet, we have so much access. Um, people are willing to help, especially if you're coming with a, a place of wanting to help, right? You're coming from a good place, it sounds like. And um, I, I'd say the domain knowledge is uh, some of the easier stuff to learn than the passion, which it sounds like you're coming from a good place with. So, awesome. thank you so much. I really appreciate that. What advice? What advice would you have for someone, or for the organization, for that matter, who a top? And this is actually a problem I've had people come to me about. You know, one of your top contributors, top performers, comes to the company, the boss, whatever mentor, and says, "You know, I really want to do something different within the company. I love the company. I don't want to leave." I, like, I see we're starting up that initiative or this, I really want to do it. And the response that they get is the little pat on the head and says, you know, just go sell. Yeah. What do you do with that? Because that's when you lose great people. And why? why? So, sure. I, mean, I talk about this a lot. I mean, I, some of it is unique culture. Like I, I just belong uh, in a unique culture. And, and uh, as, soon as, we, as soon as I bring someone on board, I already have them focus on their next play. Um, I think it creates a sense of like, 
ownership, belonging, like the culture matters so much, and I feel like the value that they contribute um, is significantly better than if um, they don't have a destiny, I guess. But also letting them know that my coaching um, and my feedback is not just going to be about current, but it's also going to be about pushing them into that next play. Um, I have open conversations. I mean, we just had career month. Um, we have a check-in on a monthly basis. I look at their IDPs. I work through them through individual development plans. I'll know when they're looking to depart months and months in advance, which allows me to plan. The other phase of that, and uh, Aaron and I talked about last night, is I try to always be recruiting, um, at least talking with people so that I have them in queue. Like we're hiring two new people. I already have a strong pipeline of talent that I can tap into, so I'm not worried about departure. I feel like that is one of the most rewarding things in management is to see someone and go fulfill like their dream. Um, you can't replace that, right? Um, so that's my approach, but I also understand that uh, you miss your revenue goal sometimes when someone's not in seat, but I'll take a quarter of missing if someone can go fulfill it, but the hope is I can do a better job of planning that. They'll let me know when they're gonna depart, hopefully months in advance, and I can put somebody in seat. Yeah. Well, you're a unicorn, so. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, I do, because they're, they're, it's not a talent shortage, and you should be able to have a process to coach people into the role. Like, uh, your job in leadership is to have a vision, and how do the players within that fulfill that vision, and then coach them to fulfill it. So um, I'm on the hook for having that, and I should have a coaching system get them there. Um, so, you know, I feel like it's the most rewarding for everyone involved. So let's make the transition and, and talk about sort of positioning. And, and I'm going to want to spend the majority of the time sort of on the on the individual contributor side. So the, the first part is, if, if that's your choice, right? Like, I've heard enough. I, that's the path I, wa I want to be on. Finding the right place. And this, this goes back to the question that, that Luke asked, right? I, I think that success has a lot to do with being in the right place at the right time. Um, and, and finding something that you can be passionate about. I've never once interviewed anybody on the show that was like, ah, I sell this, it's fine, right? Uh. No, like if you don't really, really, really care deeply about what that solution is and what it does for your clients and care about your clients, it's not gonna work. I don't care what it is, you can be in the greatest position in the world. So how are you finding that thing? And if it's not where you currently are, you know, how are you making that that next leap? Which goes back to James, the question that James asked. Yeah, I just went through that. Um, and it was a really interesting process. Um, I looked at 15 companies, 15, 16 companies. Um, I looked uh, very broadly across um, small companies, medium companies, and large companies. I've worked in all of those different segments. And I just kind of wanted to get a feel for what felt right as I was going through the process. So I was basically kind of going out for discovery again um, for my own career, right? You know, we, we kind of what direction do I want to go? And then um, pretty quickly in, I narrowed uh, about maybe two and a half, three weeks into my conversations with companies and the research that I did with those companies, I narrowed it down to eight. And, um, and I looked and then I narrowed down to three and then one. And what was so interesting for me at the stage of career that I'm at is the top three were a really tiny company, a medium sized company, which is what I chose and a very large corporation. So it was very strange to me that that's what it narrowed down to, which are all ends of the spectrum. Um, I think some of the things that, and I have obviously spent a lot of time looking for jobs in 30 years. Um, I think it's an, in, it's an art, but also a science um, to it. Um, I created a spreadsheet this time around. I had never done that before. And the spreadsheet had all the important criteria um, that were important to me in looking for a job. So things, of course, like, um, you know, uh, do I like my direct manager? Um, do I like the leadership of the company? Um, the culture of the company? What does Glassdoor say about that company? Um, 
I looked at um, a couple of different areas. I wanted to stay in the MarTech industry, but I looked at a couple of different areas of that industry. And after talking to those folks, what did I think of that industry? I looked at, does the company have a leadership position? Or are they a B player or even a C player? Um, I looked at, um, you know, of course, size, um, size of sales team, what the territory looks like for me, what the comp plan looks like for me, um, percentage of what the accelerator program looks like for me, because I like to be a 200% player. So I meet the accelerators are extremely important, how rich or not is that program and I put together that criteria of and I don't know there were maybe 25 things it was a really wide spreadsheet and um, and I just kind of went through and um, and did all of the discovery and then when things became unweighted that's when I took it down and went to from you know 15 16 to 8 companies and then uh, narrowed in more closely and the things that I think are the most important in looking for a job for me as a salesperson um, are, do I like the people I'm gonna work with? So I do a lot of blind interviewing um, in the background. I talk to their customers. I, um, I talk to people who've worked for that manager before, some at that company, some not at that company. Um, so do I like, you know, do I like the person? Do I like the, the people? Um, and then I look at compensation plan. Am I gonna be able to reach my financial goals with this program, right? And um, am I gonna love selling this? Can I fall in love with this product or solution? And those are kind of the elements for me that are, you know, kind of the final decision makers and all of those other things, you know, obviously weigh in. Something else I would like to suggest for people that are looking for a new opportunity that uh, might uh, lead to more longer term, uh, either uh, stability or a future opportunity for them also, is based on, you know, obviously you want to, the further on you get with your career, you want to be able to leverage the experience and the track record that you have. You know, obviously if you're gonna make a complete transition to something new, to a certain degree you lose some of that. Uh, so uh, a number of times in my career what I've looked at was when I, when I was, uh, say, selling a solution that, you know, for lack of a better term, was a niche solution. I would look for another company that offered that solution as part of a larger suite of products. Okay, and if you can get into that company, it gives you a chance to branch out and to learn a wider uh, swath of solutions that are related to your core expertise, but then gives you uh, more opportunities to find something you really like or to branch out. Uh, for instance, uh, the current company that I'm with, uh, Cornerstone, started out pre predominantly as a learning management system vendor. But that is, it has since then dramatically expanded the size of its suite. Uh, so you know, now I'm, uh, even though my background was originally in selling LMSs, I now am familiar with selling much more than that. And I've seen that uh, at this point, Cornerstone is less likely to hire people who only have LMS experience. But now I'm no longer in that pigeonhole because I you know, joined a company that offers a much larger range of offerings than just the niche I first had experience in. Smart stuff. Mike? Yeah, for me, it's um, what's my mission and who's going on the mission with me? Um, uh, I think you get to be a bit more selective as you've been doing this for a while. Um, without a doubt, the product becomes a, a key part of that, but now I'm interested in like, what are we looking to do here and who's going with me? You know, I made, uh, I mentioned kind of in, when we started off about, I had a tremendous director when I first started. Um, I saw a bigger opportunity with a bigger brand, did not do the research on the actual manager. And this was my second year of of, of selling and was an undefined mission and it was tough. It was really, really tough and I was miserable. Like I said, I was listening to like Elton John on Fridays at five, I'm still standing. <laughs> that's, a, that's a deep place. By the way, from a karaoke standpoint, I, uh, it's a really hard song to karaoke too. So I, a few years back, tried to do it. But um, I just think it's important of, of having like a defined uh, mission that you're going into and who are you doing it with? I think obviously it's important in terms of what tools you're going to be using, which is which is the product. But 
I've made the mistake of, of going towards the wrong essentially group I'd be collaborating with. Um, when I did leave one of my roles, everyone was like, you're going to LinkedIn? My mom was like, you're going to Lincoln? I was like, I'm on LinkedIn. <laughs> Nebraska? Um, and it was, it was relatively small. I mean, this has been eight years ago. Um, and in hindsight, it's like, yeah, he made a really good choice. It was pure serendipity. I was lucky that I noticed that it was going to be all about the data and clean data and the accuracy of data and that there really wasn't that in B2B because my other role just didn't have any data. I was like, this is a big opportunity. So people were actually like, what are you doing? You're making a, a bad decision. But I was like, look, there's a differentiated product here um, that happens to have great leadership but also a great mission which is to help people be more productive and successful. It's hard not to get behind that. But I'd like to say I was a genius in selecting that, but it's pure serendipity and luck. So, yeah. <laughs> Did you have, because you talked about aligning your mission before, and though that seems incredibly well aligned yeah. with LinkedIn. Did you have that going in? Yeah, I would say, again, I was younger in my career, and um, you, know, you change your priorities, I think, as, as, you, as you move along. And I think at the time, um, there was definitely that outlier goal I didn't really piece it together though, in terms of like, I really do want to help communities at some point bring like economic opportunity to those communities. Don't know, don't really how to do it. LinkedIn just had to be, the, you know, it just happens to be the perfect place to potentially, potentially do that later in life. And so, no, it was luck again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, let, so let's talk about the, the due diligence because I, it sounds like most of us uh, sitting up here have made uh, at least one wrong turn in our careers. Um, and, and sometimes we maybe have done all of it right and it still didn't quite turn out. But in terms of mitigating that risk, and I've got two risk mitigation questions, but as far as doing the due diligence, Debbie, you did, you talked about all the front end, but I know there's sort of more to it and the types of questions to just figure out because getting a new job is, it, it's a sales process. Right, you build a pipeline. Debbie just went through hers, right? Like you've got a pipeline, you've got these different opportunities. But what's different about this versus anything else is I only got one product to sell, and it represents a hundred percent of me, right? So I think the amount of like, yes, the company has to choose you, but you really need to be intentional about where you're choosing to go because the impacts are so so great. So. What can you do? How can you best do that due diligence to validate and make sure you're making the right choice and you're not, you don't get there and go, oh my gosh, great company, horrible manager, I'm screwed, among other failures. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, um, it goes back to, I sound like a preacher, but it goes back to the discovery process. It's, you've got to have your list of questions. You've got to ask them with all of the people that you are talking to, if you think that there are pieces missing in their interview process, for example, I wanted to talk to customer success. So um, that wasn't part of the company's process. Um, very often if I'm going to join a startup, and I've been with several of them, I want to talk to board members. I want to talk to customers, right? That's not part of their process. So you just go out and you make it happen. So I asked the, um, the woman that I was interviewing with, I'd really like to talk to your customer, customer success leader that I'll be working with. You know, So the person that leads that team of the managers that I'll be working with. And, um, and I developed a list of questions, again, kind of triangulating a, set, a, a piece of those questions with um, with each of the stakeholders because again you want to make sure that the company everybody's kind of singing the same song right that everybody's on the same page it's a really important piece when you join a company you know are they all kind of saying the same things is this consistent or is somebody snowing me right and so um, <laughs> and so um, it, you know it's important to go in with that list of questions to triangulate that and to also control the process so Typically, I set the table just like I would at a sales call when I interview. I say, I'm, you know, I'm so excited to talk with you and to learn more about your organization. I know you have some questions for me. If you don't mind, I'd like to kind of just set the table. I have a, a list of questions, and, um, and then I will, of course, make sure that you have time to ask some as well. How many people do that in an interviewing process, right? But I, I do it every time. And, um, and it gives me an opportunity to really drill in and understand and qualify the opportunity. 
for myself. And frankly, um, they get a really good view of how I run a sales process. And so it's, it's, a, it's a win-win situation. Um, and, and again, you, you, know, you start soft with the questions, like, um, just like you would in discovery, softball kinds of questions. Help me to understand a little bit about your, your team, who are the players, um, where are the gaps on your team, right? Those kinds of questions. And then you go into you know, some of the more uh, challenging questions. And I like to be really direct in my interview process in the same way that I am in my sales process. So it's all about um, please be transparent with me and I will always be transparent with you. And that, that it's, it's really almost an identical mm -hmm. process. Yeah. I love your Excel doc and the list of questions that you run through. That sounds like an incredible uh, asset right there. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, if I may, at the same time, you can do everything right. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do all this discovery that uh, Debbie has uh, re referenced, and which is all the things you should do, and it still may not work out. That's right. Uh, it's, you know, there's, there, the circumstance that the company you joined could change. The manager could change, or the industry could, you know, it could get Amazon or something like that. And you can't be sure. <laughs> Uh, what will happen? So, you know, I, it's uh, important to understand that you know not everything is within your control, but choose positions, particularly when you're earlier in your career, and you know you're thinking not just about money at the time, but about de personal development and the opportunity to move into new things. Uh, somebody, uh, I think yesterday, Mench alluded to Steve Jobs' commencement speech at Stanford. I believe it's the one and only commencement speech she made. It's on YouTube. If anyone, you sh I would highly recommend you watch it. It's absolutely amazing. But uh, among other things, he pointed out that, you know, people are always saying connect the dots on your career to move forward. And he's saying it's impossible to always know that. Quite often you have to look back and realize, oh, okay, these things that were unconnected at the time have wound up making me more capable to, uh, mm -hmm. better at doing what I do now. And so, you know, if you continue to look for opportunities that are promising, that uh, offer the chance for personal growth, uh, you know, you ride that horse as long as you can, but if the circumstances change, you'd be prepared to make a change, especially when you're younger in your career. There, everybody has made a false start or two, and I would submit that, uh, you know, if you haven't made a false start or two, you're playing too conservative. Yeah. Right. I yeah. would agree with that. I think that um, everybody <laughs> makes mistakes. I think um, the the concept around making a mistake is to un listen to yourself, understand, you know, go, oh, I made a mistake, it's okay. Forgive yourself, pick up yourself by the bootstraps and move on, just like Jacqueline kind of talked about in her life, right? You know, you go, oh, crap, I made a mistake. And it happens, and it happens a lot when you've been had longevity in your career at, at, a, at a company. You know, you kind of make a jump. It just happened to me, you know, made a jump. Oh, crap, I really made a mistake. Um, I want to course correct pretty quickly, and, um, and I want to learn from that mistake. What things didn't I ask? What things didn't I do? But everybody makes mistakes. That's part of it, and that's how you learn to pick yourself up, and that's how your character becomes built and who you are, and, um, and that's the richness of, of our lives and, and our paths and journeys. Yeah. So the great thing about being an individual contributor is the amount of freedom. At the same time, there are many things completely out of your control your territory, your comp plan, your direct manager, like a lot of those things. What can you do to mitigate some of those risks and challenges that really truly are beyond your control? Or maybe I'm just not thinking about them right and you figure out some way to control some of those elements. There are some things out of your control at all times. Uh, you know, on compensation plans, I've been frustrated by changing compensation plans. Uh, as much as probably anyone has in my career. And I, I've had a couple of cases, including in my current company, where they adjusted a compensation plan the following year. I'm convinced because I made out like a bandit the previous yes. year. <laughs> they weren't, they weren't yep. going to let that happen again. Yep. You yep. Know, uh, you know, or for whatever reason, the company shifted priorities in terms of what they wanted to emphasize in the, in the, the mix of products and solutions that you sell. So they made changes. I mean, to a certain degree, you have to roll with them. You know, compensation plans drive behavior, and uh, you know, compensation plans should be aligned with the overall strategic objectives of the company. So, you know, I, I there, there's only so much you can do about that, other than emphasize, you know, once again that uh, you should you should be very wary of 
of selling in a way that is not aligned with the objectives of the company because nobody's going to get behind you if that happens. And frankly, why are you doing it? You know, uh, go find a different company where you are more aligned if you don't want to choose to sell what the company is emphasizing the compensation plan. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I guess I don't really know of a way to mitigate the risk of changing compensation plans. You, that's, you know, that's the rules of engagement you're given each year. And uh, most companies do not want to change them too dramatically because it's very disruptive. And hopefully, uh, you know, your company is not uh, in a position of such turmoil or management tr or turnover or industry disruption where that happens on a regular basis. Yeah. Debbie, you and I talked on, on our episode about, I mean, you've got just a great mindset around, oh, you do the evaluation, like, okay, what is the new situation? What does that mean? How does that affect me? Mm -hmm. And then you're just making a decision. Like, I'm, I'm either going to stay, and if I am, okay, like, move on. Right, and, and Paul and I uh, from Cintas had, had that same conversation where the times that he has missed has been because he didn't get over the, the challenge quickly enough. It weighed on him for too long and he wasn't able to recover and probably finish number two in all of CentOS instead of, of number one. But you know, I, I think your process makes a, a lot of, of sense because you just have to make a choice. And so you make do. the decision and move on. Yeah, you do. You have to evalu evaluate it. You can always provide feedback on it. I have um, tried providing proactive feedback. Um, so getting um, getting before the end of the year, you know, they're always looking at comp plans in November and December. Um, and I have definitely been uh, part of, I made too much money, so they changed the comp plan. Um, and. I think that you can proactively, if you've got good relationships in the organization, say, I'd love to know kind of what, what the, the framework of it looks like for next year and um, provide feedback, you know, I, it just help me to understand why we're doing that, right, that kind of thing, um, you know, what's, what's the focus, et cetera. But at the end of the day, you're, you know, you, you've got to evaluate what's best for you and you're either on or, you know, you're out, right? But you've got to um, you've got to be agile because things are always changing in the world of sales, and um, and you have to buy in, and you want to buy in quickly so you don't waste time, or get out and go make yourself happy, you know, and find what you want. And it's really, I mean, I know it's I'm like oh, it's just that simple, but it really is just that simple. Um, you're in charge. No. Yeah, I, and just to piggyback off that, I, I really believe it's about. Be asking yourself, like, are you a company person? Are you are you aligned with the bigger why and mission of the organization? And uh, th within my time within Namely, I mean, I went from focusing on the entire world as a territory, um, everything from Europe to to uh, Australia to as the company's growing now to 500 plus employees. Right, your territory gets <laughs> divided and divided and divided. To now we're um, just Southern California, right? Where so um, absolutely with territory change, uh, you, you have to. Sometimes you're like, whoa, like I just lost like half my accounts or half my territory, or I just had to give all these accounts I've prospected to another account executive that's coming over. But again, the why and alignment needs to be bigger than the the kind of personal perspective. But uh, again, if if it's not going to fit for you, then yeah, you have the freedom of choice in this market, absolutely to go somewhere. Yeah. Along those lines, if I may add, on it, circumstances change at a company. I, I alluded earlier about uh, what stage in the life cycle is the company at as the company grows. Territories get smaller. Compensation plans get less less uh, lucrative mm -hmm. in many ways. And it's just, uh, it's just the way it is. I've often made a joke at some of the startups I've worked with where I say, uh, if this company becomes what I want it to become, it will become a company I don't want to work for anymore because I don't want to work for a huge bureaucratic company, but I want the company to be successful to grow huge. And that's where it's a matter of timing. And it may be time when the company hits a certain level of maturity where, okay, you know, I've done my part. You know, I've gotten what I wanted out of it. I've been a good soldier, contributed to help the company get this point. No hard feelings. It's time to move and to move on. Great stuff. Great stuff. The queue is forming again, so I'll, I'll ask uh, the audience to ask smarter questions than me. One, mentioning comp plans and changes in comp plans uh, real, real quick. In, in the ANSYS Q4 conference call, we actually pointed to commission expense as one of the reasons why our profitability was high but not quite as high as we wanted is because everyone was making so much money, which, 
you know, wow, wow, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get over it, I guess. Um, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm I, quick backdrop. I, I'm in a hybrid role. Like we're talking management as well as direct uh, or, or you know, kind of uh, you know, individual contributor. I have 15 to 20 accounts that I'm accountable for as far as my own performance. In addition to that, I actually manage a, um, a, a group of channel partners uh, that um, their job is to only sell for us. So it's not like we have to struggle with mind share or they selling enough of what we're doing. But looking at wanting to, 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 to develop them, it's a little bit different, more of a shoulder to shoulder kind of thing as opposed to, hey, you work for me because you're not a badged employee, if that makes sense. So I'm just wondering when it comes to being a new manager, you know, taking these risks that you mentioned about you know, trying, trying it out and those kind of things as, as I'm now doing in this new role. How do you, when you see greatness in a rep and an AE who can really go out there and kill it, but maybe they're doing good, but you feel like there's so much more in them. How have you managed to, to help get them to the point and, and really develop them to the point that, that they're really able to exceed, you know, you know um, be at their true potential? Kind of a big question, so... Whoever wants to go first. So the question is like how to notice or observe? How do you, yeah, I mean, how do you take someone or you, when you see some amazing traits in someone yeah. and, and they're underperforming, not saying performing badly, but not, not, not performing at their true potential, what kind of things do you look at to uncover to try to get them to the point where they're, they're, they're able to achieve their true potential as you, as you see it? Yeah, I think it... it I mean, it's because I have a process in it, but it, like ultimately, I want them to uh, own their success. So, like the Steve Kerr example of, I can nudge you, but right. ultimately, it's going to be up to you. And I think it starts with, um, I want to qualify the opportunity for them to work on our team up front and be uh, completely honest about the benefits and, and the downside, but also that if they're knowing that they're signing up for a transformational experience, and that when they do. The requirement is you got to have an individual development plan to do so. Sure. And so that check-in allows us to say, like, hey, are you progressing against that? Um, or are you off? Or have it has it changed? Like, it's totally fine to change it. But m m what I want to do with you right now is to nudge you, to give you, but I'm not coming down um, hard on them. It's just like, hey, like, I want you to get to your goals. Right. Um, keep doing it. You seem to be coming a little, like, to be open and honest with you, but constructive. Feel as if you know you're missing some of your marks here, but I try to, um, you know, review processes. There's like formative and there's summative. Like the summative is really like end of six months, and you're like, hey, you've been doing all these things wrong. What are you doing? Right. The hope is like during one-on-ones, I'm consistently yeah. observing and giving feedback, and so it just feels organic and doesn't feel threatening, and it all goes up into their development plan to hopefully um, get there. I think it's when you bottle things up and you're not open, honest, and constructive with them frequently, that's where things get a little off. Cool. That's a pretty good answer. I don't know how you're going to take that. You're going to take that? All right. Check the box. <laughs> anything, anything else? Okay, good. So along the lines of taking, we, we've focused, spent a lot of time on the individual contributor piece, but moving into management. So if you're in that individual contributor role, you have aspirations to move down the leadership path, oftentimes that first step is really challenging. So how can you best position yourself uh, for that opportunity? What, what should you be doing so that you're going to have the best odds to be able to take that, that step once it becomes available, whether it's inside your organization or, or outside, and, and maybe those perspectives are different? Sure, I'll, I'll take a first crack. Uh, first, uh, reach out to some other managers within the organization that are successful and ask them what, are their, you know, what do they consider the most important things you should focus on. Uh, secondly, uh, seek out management training opportunities, whether your company provides them or whether you have to go out you know, or get your company to pay for them. But do get some training. Don't try to reinvent the wheel yourself. And then uh, lastly, be prepared to change and change often as you discover what works. And then finally, learn how to say no. You have to say no to all of these demands that are going to come to your time. I can't remember the exact details, but I remember seeing a report once that said, uh, there's a, uh, approximately 70, 70 responsibilities that the average frontline sales manager has as an ongoing part of their job. Most sales managers, when polled, think they've got a good handle on approximately 20. You know, they're, they're always aware of there's other stuff they could do that they cannot. 
There's only so many hours in the day. You can't uh, be a slave to your work. You know, uh, the business of life is not business but living. To, to be a balanced person and to continue to grow and not burn out, you have to be able to say no. Those are some of my thoughts on that. That was fantastic. Next. <laughs> I, I think a, another piece is, um, is just um, is socializing what you're looking to do next um, with folks and um, in whether it's a casual kind of engagement or whether it's a weekly or monthly or whatever you're doing with your manager. Um, look, this is kind of the direction that I'm interested in going. And what feedback would you provide me um, that would help me be, you know, kind of get there, right? What are the skill sets that um, that I need to learn? Um, you know, where do you think, um, you know, I need opportunities for growth? I want to spend the next X amount of time doing that. And my hope is in the next X amount of time, right, six months, nine months, whatever it looks like, um, you know, I'd like to be considered for that kind of opportunity. And, um, and I think you need to, you know, state what you want, ask for feedback so that you can grow and get there. And, um, and also ask for feedback, you know, not just to your direct manager, but to the people that you collaborate with and engage with, because those are going to, you know, give you some of the best feedback that's kind of real and, um, and that's going to be really critical and helpful. Um, and then state your time frame of kind of what you're looking to do because um, I don't think you know if if there weren't going to be an opportunity for two years I were at a small company I'm not sure I'd want to wait around for that you know I'd want to know that right what, what do you think that time frame looks like here at this company I would love to do it here right but if not you know so it's, it's okay yeah Great stuff, and, and I think this is um, this is relevant for it, really any transition, right? Whether you're looking to move from SDR to AE, you're looking, you know, this this is valid for any transition. Under being clear about this is what it looks like, getting feedback, surrounding yourself with the mentors, right? Defining a timeline. Great, great, great stuff. Colin, Mike, anything you guys want to add? Colin, I was going to say, I, I think to that point, it definitely helps if whether it's within your organization or in other organizations, you have like a prototype you can you can look up to and say. Okay, I, that's somebody that I, I do actively want to seek how they got to that position because I could see myself in that position or I want to experience uh, the success in their career that they're at. Um, so just to piggyback off what you were saying, Deb, I, I'd say you know, that, that's super helpful because it makes it more real too, right? And you're saying like, okay, this is a reality, this is a career path they followed to get there and it helps paint the picture of how, how you can also get to that level. Yeah, I, I agree with all three. I think it... Um as a hiring manager, um, that conversations I mentioned before where the person hadn't expressed intention, also didn't have examples, and also didn't have a brand. I think all three of those create momentum, kind of what Kyle was talking about yesterday. As a hiring manager, I want someone who's got momentum because it reduces my risk because I know I, it's a known quantity. But I also, when I go back to my director and say, I hired this person, um, they're like, no brainer, right? So I want to be able as a hire manager almost to like open that door and just be like, come on in, you know? But that requires you to have momentum, which I think is the intent, the awareness, but also examples of, of what you've done that's been promoted, which is building your brand. Beautiful. We've got time for maybe one or two more questions from the audience if you guys have got anything. Otherwise, we can just call it early and start it right. <laughs> so it's, I, it's something I've noticed, but I want to kind of preface it with a question. Debbie, how long did it take you to find that job that you just, with Sprinkler, right? Yep. How, how long did, it, did that search process take? It's going to really surprise you when I say this. Um, I think it's just because I've highly honed it. It took me 35 days. Okay. So that's not where I was going with this, but... Um, <laughs> One of the things that I noticed a lot of yesterday and I noticed a lot on this, this panel um, today too is the amount of patience and perspective that you guys all bring to the table with you because you come out of college and it's get a job, you got bills to pay, you got debt to you know dig your way out of, and then you want to make that next move and everything in the industry that we work in is fast, 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 fast. But in order to make the right decisions, you have to call on the perspective that you've kind of gained over time and you also have to make sure that you are patient enough to make sure that you flesh out all the opportunities and things. And so um, you blew me right out of the water with the 35-day process, but clearly you've done it enough times to, to have it honed. I think just, and I don't know if anybody else has noticed this too, but I just noticed the amount of, hurt, it, like 
not being in a rush, you know, over the last couple of days. Don't pitch before you get out of discovery. Don't make a risky or, or be willing to make mistakes and be okay with making mistakes, but make sure you ask all the right questions when you're going to make a move. And that's something that is, I think, counterintuitive to a lot of people who do what we do. But in the top performers, it's evident. And I just want to say I noticed that. So do you guys have any commentary on that? I don't know, but I don't know positive, optimistic, and feel like I'm moving forward is just the consumption of skills and experiences because eventually you have to tell a story to someone. Um, so I'm intent, you know, as long as I can get those in my current role, like I'm good. Um, I can be patient if I w and that took me a while. Like I, I, when I was talking about the franchise, like I was completely dependent and gave all my power and leverage to someone else to fulfill my quota and everything else I was doing. And then it was that that, sh that shift I had in my mindset, which was like, that sucks. It's kind of, it's boring. Yeah. You know, you, you lose control. And so that's where I was like, look, I'm just gonna start collecting some skills and some experiences so that when I wanna do the next thing, at least I have something to talk about. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Sometimes when you jump too quickly, right? When you, when you dive in too quickly without being thoughtful, you make mistakes. And that's, um, what you're hearing, I think, from a lot of people who are here at this conference is um, there's a lot of wisdom in the room, and it's from people making mistakes. Mm -hmm. That's how you gather that wisdom. And um, if you do a great job connecting with people in your network and, um, and mentoring and finding mentors and just having real conversations, I think that you can gain wisdom in a lot of ways. You know, you can gain it through personal experience, you can gain it through people's experiences, right, along the way. And so um, listening is such an important piece, listening to yourself, listening to the people around you, you know, and, um, and knowing that the grass isn't always greener on the other side. So doing due diligence really in all the important aspects of your life is incredibly important, right? Choosing a partner, raising your children, you know, uh, we spend, eight, 10 hours a day in our career, you know? So that's a pretty important decision, right? Those, those big ones, I think, are worth doing the due diligence and just being really careful. But um, you wanna do it at a cadence that isn't gonna take you a long time, and that comes from personal drive. Yeah. I wasn't able to do any due diligence on my children they just yeah. kind of yeah <laughs> not those guys you'll have to but explain that to yeah, me later yeah, yeah. The due diligence is along the way with them all right, right? All right. <laughs> so my question will take us in a slightly different direction but i think it's it's very relevant and um uh, timely um we live in an age of information automation um, artificial and adaptive intelligence and a lot of the functions of a salesperson um, have changed fairly dramatically in the last few years, and as we look ahead, are likely to change significantly again. Um, what do you see as the future of um, the sales profession, the sales career? What would you tell your children or grandchildren about, you know, the future of selling? I'm happy, happy to start there. I'd say because of all the autom automation and robots and bots and chatbots and email autoresponders uh, that are amongst us, um, we've got a phrase that, that we use, it's called be human, right? And I'd say, if anything, it's made, I, I firmly believe the salesperson all the more valuable, right? The set of communication skills that we have, and, and it was the topic that kicked off this conference was that human interaction, right? So putting the phone down and, and being human with one another, that's, that's an asset and skill that I'd say will only become more and more valuable in the marketplace and more, and more of a rare, um, uh, commodity uh, to, to be applied, and um, I, I would I would only share that it's going to become more and more important to focus on that interpersonal communication, um, and that human interaction. So that, that's what I would share. Yeah, so. I could not agree more with Colin's statement. Uh, as we get more and more data, it's I distinguish data as being separate from information. Information being useful that you can uh, that you can use, and it's becoming overwhelming out there. And uh, as a consultative salesperson, I think our role is to help our uh, prospects and clients separate the signal from the noise. And that's not something that a computer can do. 
Uh, and you can only do it if you adequately understand what your client's drivers are and what's affecting them and then matching them with what's relevant. Nobody's got time to sort through everything that's out there on their own. It is through us doing it for them that we come that we add value. Yeah. My son is actually very interested in going to sales. He's 20 years old and um, and I um, just introduced him to a CMO who helped him get a VC funded internship. And so the question is so relevant to me because we, we talk about it a lot. And, um, and human interaction and having conversations is so important. Talk to my son a lot about listening, listening to the people around them, him listening to, um, you know, to uh, podcasts, you know, kind of gaining some of that wisdom. And, um, and to not be, um, you know, I think all, everyone kind of has this ADD because, you know, with all the um, computer stuff and the internet and, you know, everybody's multitasking. And I think that it's so important to, um, to just slow down and really connect with people and, um, and listen and not, not be so, you know, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here without actually really engaging and pulling in the information and processing it. And, and I talk with him a lot about that in taking your time and, um, and really processing what's going on around you and trying to be helpful and coming from that good place inside. Yeah. I had really high expectations for this panel and, and like most everything the last couple of days, this has way exceeded that. So thank you, Mike, Debbie, Bill, and Colin. <laughs> <laughs>